Afternoon, folks. My name is Alex Lennon. I'm the editor of the Washington Quarterly here at CSIS. I'm also a senior fellow <coughs> in the security program. Um, we have just finished a project, actually, on the future of democracy support in U.S. security strategy, which we'll be talking about a bit during the session. And I'm delighted to welcome you here to this bipartisan dialogue on the future of democracy support. Um, what we'll do for the session is we'll actually do this in a couple of different parts. Both uh, House members may have to leave. Um, apparently, there's a couple of other votes going on on the Hill today about something. Actually, we're just afraid of the questions. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's sort of a duck and run exercise. Um, so what uh, we'd like to do is have, the, uh, have them make initial remarks, and then we'll open it up to the question and answer session. We're delighted both to have uh, Lauren Craner and Ken Wallach as well here. And when we open it up um, beyond that, we'll open up the question and answer, and they'll get into the dialogue as well uh, subsequently. Uh, for starters, I'd like to welcome the co-chairs of the House Democracy Assistance Commission, both Representative well, That's David not quite right. That's not quite right based on our hierarchy. We should say that. <laughs> he's, the chairman. He, he's the chairman. I'm the ranking member. My apologies. <laughs> um, Representative Dreyer from California. And we'll actually start with uh, remarks um, from Representative Price from North Carolina. OK, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you and with this uh, distinguished panel, fellow panelists. and. Uh, I want to thank CSIS and IRI and NDI and anybody else who sponsored this event. We have uh, quite a collaborative effort here. And uh, we're going to talk about another collaborative effort, that is uh, democracy promotion and particularly promoting the development of, um, of strong and effective and responsive uh, legislatures in, um, in our partner countries around the world, the mission of the House Democracy Assistance Commission. Um, this has been a, a, a partnership, and it's a much more crowded field, fortunately, in the sense of many players. Contrasts uh, in many ways to the uh, first such effort back in the early 90s when the Frost-Solomon Commission first began working in Central and Eastern Europe with the former uh, communist states as all of a sudden showcase parliaments had to become real parliaments. I was involved in that effort, as was uh, David Dreyer, and uh, at, uh, at that time the uh, the field wasn't as uh, replete with, uh, with, with groups working effectively. Now, fortunately, we have lots of partners, and we do take pains to, uh, to, not, uh, to not replicate each other's efforts, but to, to, to complement each other's efforts. And I think we, we succeeded that uh, very well. And it's a particular pleasure for me to work with uh, David Dreyer. It's, it's true, I'm the chairman now, and he's the ranking member. But then it wasn't too long ago that he was the chairman, and I was the ranking member, uh, given the way things uh, work in the House. In fact, David was the founding chairman of this, of this effort um, four years ago. And um, he has uh, shown a, a, a passionate commitment to the work of our commission and to strengthen democratic institutions. And it was his leadership that got us launched. And, and uh, of course, he's continuing to be a full partner in this uh, effort. We have 20 members operating on a bipartisan basis in a very, uh, very effective way. Um, I uh, just prepared a few minutes of remarks here to, to get us started. We want to have a, have a discussion with you. I'll just say a word, though, about, uh, about our work and also about some of the lessons I think we've learned about uh, democracy promotion uh, as we uh, enter a new administration and, and, uh, and as, as uh, on a fairly widespread basis, I think we're going to be rethinking uh, foreign assistance and foreign aid, and uh, I would hope that... Uh, the, the question of democracy promotion and, and aid to uh, institutions of the, of the sort we've been involved in would be, uh, would be on that agenda. Our founding premise, as we often say on uh, HDAC, is that democracy isn't just about elections. Democracy is equally about what happens between elections and advancing voters' concerns through peaceful, constitutional, responsive means uh, requires moving beyond elections and developing the capacities of representative institutions. Um, we uh, uh, have uh, had an opportunity to, to uh, travel worldwide. We're no longer focused just on Central and Eastern Europe as the Frost uh, Solomon group was. We, we have 12 partners uh, worldwide, and we'll add a, add a few more uh, judiciously. We, uh, we have um, observed democracy promotion efforts of our government and, and other governments and, and do have a few suggestions about how we might proceed in, in the years ahead now with the new administration. I think we do need to take a good look at how our democracy promotion resources are allocated. The high-profile crises of the day notwithstanding, democracy funding needs to be allocated to sustain programs in nations that are still in the midst of democratic transitions and to support nations beginning such uh, transitions. Uh, we must avoid devoting outsized uh, portions of the budget to a 
concentrated uh, group of recipients to the detriment of burgeoning democracies that may have uh, smaller, lower profiles. Moreover, we need to uh, be persistent in this. We need to finish the job. The rug can't be pulled out from under nations just as they're beginning to stabilize or beginning to show some, uh, some success. A good case in point, I think, is sub-Saharan Africa, where there have been numerous positive democratic developments uh, recently. Africa currently receives less than half as much in democracy assistance funding as any other region in the world on a per country basis. In sub-Saharan Africa, the U.S. funds only seven democracy strengthening programs working directly with national legislatures, and one of those is Ethiopia, where it's, as Freedom House flatly states, is understates, is not an electoral democracy. Of the roughly $1.5 billion our country spends on democracy promotion, one-fourth is spent in Afghanistan and Iraq. In all, the top ten largest recipients claim more than half the budget. In fact, the money spent annually in Afghanistan alone is enough to fund the entire democracy assistance program in sub-Saharan Africa. The Africa example suggests that we may be misdeploying our resources in three key ways. First, we aren't spreading money around sufficiently. Um, Iraq and Afghanistan are clearly priorities, but they shouldn't be allowed to cripple efforts uh, elsewhere. Secondly, sometimes we're allocating funding in the wrong places. Uh, we need to focus on places where our efforts can, uh, can have a, a strong marginal uh, impact. Uh, uh, Non-democracies like Ethiopia, in my opinion, should take a back seat to democracies in transition. And thirdly, uh, support too often doesn't extend to key governmental institutions, particularly the legislative branch. I'm hopeful that the new administration will make it a point to include legislative branches both in capacity building programs and in consultation on bilateral policy making. A second area in need of re-examination re is the set of assumptions that currently guides uh, how and with whom we engage. Two, two quick points here. The first is that the new administration must in emphasize engagement with institutions, not individuals. Much has been made uh, of, of President Bush's uh, personal relationships, uh, at least initially, with Russian President Putin and then uh, Pakistani President Musharraf. Uh, but, uh, you know, overly personalizing diplomacy is just as risky when the leaders are firmly committed to democracy. In any case, we need to focus on institutional development, not just uh, personal diplomacy. Indeed, instead, the new administration should emphasize the construction of effective, enduring institutions by supporting <coughs> capacity, building of capacity in the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government, fostering civil society and media, promoting active political debate. In many cases, successfully supporting the development of democracy might even entail enabling the political participation of opponents and critics of, uh, of, of leaders that are friendly uh, to us. Um, and that leads to the second point. Uh, our credibility is undermined to the extent it is seen as partial, partial to our country's most vocal friends or partial to our near-term bilateral interests. Uh, U.S. democracy strengthening programs should, to the extent possible, engage all relevant parties. Such a principle will, particularly with regard to Islamist parties in the Middle East, mean engaging parties that are dubious or sometimes even hostile toward U.S. interests. But we'll do well to remember, I think, that when these increasingly popular parties actually take power, their policies will be shaped by their experiences in opposition and their perception of the U.S. posture toward their political participation. Engagement with these parties offers the U.S. an opportunity to encourage their commitment to democracy, as well as the expression of their views and grievances through democratic means. Finally, I'd suggest that Democracy promotion as a discipline can't be considered in isolation. It must be coordinated with a broader range of U.S. foreign assistance programs. Uh, transitioning democracies uh, need to be able to deliver some, some kind of democracy dividend, a tangible improvement in the quality of life uh, for their citizens. Such an improvement is vital for cementing public support for democracy, and our development assistance programs can play a key role in helping new democracies deliver the goods. Uh, more than that, democracy assistance should be coordinated with large infusions of foreign aid, such as through the, the Millennium Challenge Account, so that governments develop the capabilities to manage and oversee such projects. Unfortunately, all too often our foreign assistance can seem like a zero-sum game. As Millennium Challenge money comes in, democracy assistance is phased out. 
As policymakers take on the difficult challenge of foreign aid reform, I urgently advocate mechanisms for ensuring far greater coordination so that our democracy assistance efforts and our broader foreign aid can achieve a true synergy. So let me stop there and turn to David Dreyer. Uh, thank you. I look forward to our discussion. Senator Thank you very much, Alex, and uh, to Ken and, and Lauren, and of course David Price, and to all at CSIS. It's a, it's a great privilege to, uh, to be back once again uh, talking about our favorite subject, and that is the building of democracies around the world. Uh, we last year uh, had a great celebration of the 25th anniversary of Ronald Reagan's Great Westminster speech, which led to the establishment of ensuring that Lauren and Ken are employed, that being the uh, establishment of the National Endowment for Democracy and uh, the core organizations, which have been very important. And I really see uh, our House Democracy Assistance Commission as an offshoot of that original vision that was put forward by President Reagan then and has had strong uh, bipartisanship. And in many ways, I would argue that the work that is going on in democracy building is um, is more important today or as important as it ever has been. And uh, I think that ensuring that it continues to be a high priority is something that all of us are committed to. And uh, I hope that, uh, that our government will continue to have the strong commitment that it has in the past. This organization is, uh, well, the, the issue of democracy building and, and the question is, is, I believe in many ways, misunderstood. It's, it's often seen as uh, simply a, a priority of the, uh, the extreme, liberal, bleeding heart left, or as a, a tool, as a weapon in the arsenal of the neoconservatives. And that really, from my perspective, does not correctly characterize the importance of democracy building. The reason being that if you look at um, the question of peace and stability, economic growth, and ensuring, as David correctly said, this need to uh, have gauges that determine our success, that being improving the quality of life for peoples around the world, uh, that is really what this is about. And uh, I think that um, the notion that we've had in the past of the United States of America through democracy building, attempting to impose its form of government on peoples around the world, Again, um, I believe to be a real mischaracterization as I've always wondered how it is that you can impose self-determination on people. And uh, <clears throat> to build on what, what David said, I, I, uh, I argue that one election of democracy does not make, and the real work begins after the elections. And in many ways, there are more than a few countries that become more vulnerable after the transition than they had been before. And that's why uh, this work continues to be uh, of, of utmost importance to us. Uh, this commission uh, is right now partnered with 12 countries around the world. I'm going to try and name them if I can, and I'm sure David will uh, catch me if, if, I, if I don't include all of them for you. Uh, Mongolia, Indonesia, Timor-Leste, Haiti, Colombia, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Liberia, Kenya, Macedonia, Ukraine, Georgia. What have I left out, David? I think that's it. I got 12. I got 12, okay. And right now, I don't think that I would be um, breaking any, any confidence to say that we have just had a staff delegation looking at the newest country in the world, that being Kosovo. And um, so we very much want to do what we can to ensure that, that we assist in building the parliaments, because we all know that as you look at these institutions um, th that exist, the parliament is, uh, certainly from the perspective of David Price and, and me, this is, this is uh, uh, the most important part of government. I mean, we are the first among equals, the first branch of government, so we understand how important uh, the United States Congress and parliaments are. And we know that when it comes to the issue of Oversight. I mean, I should tell you just a little bit about what it is that our commission does, because we spend time with uh, these countries, with these parliamentarians and their staffs, uh, working to do many things that we have a tendency to take for granted. Um, committee oversight of the executive branch, building um, a budget process, building the libraries for these parliaments, um, 
constituent service. And one of our great, you know, anecdotally, one of our great experiences was uh, we were in Kenya and went to Ambaselli in the south and were able to see the kind of work that a member of the parliament, of the Kenyan parliament did in, in working with constituents there. And it was a very, very eye-opening process. And to me, as I look at one of the most interesting accomplishments, and we're not quite there yet, but we've really made very bold steps uh, towards it, is that you take the, the most populous Muslim country in the world, the fourth most populous country in the world, Indonesia, uh, we found in our first trip there that the Indonesian parliament, in fact, has its entire uh, staffing and budgeting process and all of the hiring within the parliament handled by the executive branch. Now, we sat with President Yodhoy Ono in Jakarta and talked with him about this, and you know, the notion of uh, having either George Bush or Barack Obama hire my staff was something that I had a difficult time with. And as we made this case to members of the Indonesian parliament, um, they have been very sympathetic. And interestingly enough, uh, President Yodhoyono was uh, responsive in a positive way to that. Now, there are some within the government who are not, but we have continued to beat this drum with a great deal of enthusiasm about the need for independence uh, of the parliament from the executive branch. And uh, I think that if you look at directly impacting a large number of people, and when you've got whatever Indonesia is, 230 million people, uh, this has, I believe, the opportunity, creates the opportunity for us to have a really wide-ranging impact on working directly parliament to parliament. So. Uh, I will, will say that I um, also, bipartisanship is something that everyone is talking about. The president talked about it last night in his news conference. We all uh, throw that out. We all aspire to trying to deal with our economic downturn and a wide range of other issues in a bipartisan way. There is no better example of bipartisanship than the relationship that my partner David Price and I have in working with this commission. In fact, I'm I'm always proud to say we've never had a single vote. We've worked on consensus in determining the countries that will be our partners and uh, in determining our priorities. We haven't always agreed on absolutely everything, but we've been able to very easily come to a consensus. And I would like to think that in parliaments around the world and maybe even in the Congress of the United States, we could use our commission as a model. So thank you all very much. Great. Uh, to take advantage of the congressman's time while they're here, we're going to open it up directly to a question and answer session, um, which uh, both Ken Wallach and Lauren Crane have been gracious enough to say, don't have us do remarks, we'll just talk in the uh, question and answer. There are two microphones at the front. If I can ask people um, to come up to those microphones, I'll point directly. I'm going to ask the first question as we launch into it, and then we'll go uh, directly over here. Can I ask both of you, what do you expect that democracy assistance, both political and development assistance, will come under extraordinary pressure because of the financial downturn. How vulnerable is financial assistance right now because of the ongoing fiscal crisis? David's on the Appropriations Committee. <laughs> that would be a pass to you. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, I don't feel like I can give you a very, uh, a, a very precise uh, answer, but um, I, I don't think it's just totally wishful thinking to, uh, to, to believe that uh, we have um, – we have – pretty well made clear our intent to, to keep um, – we're, we're going to look very carefully at foreign aid and Howard Berman, and, and there's a lot of support for this uh, from, from all sorts of quarters. But Howard Berman's made very clear that uh, he's going to uh, use these early months to, 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 to take a, a, a very hard look at, at, at foreign assistance. And of course, the new administration coming in, our, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that as well. I. Uh, I do not. I do not expect that to include a, uh, a serious reduction in foreign foreign aid levels. Now there will be pressures on uh, on all sorts of uh, components of the budget. But um, one thing that has happened, and I hope this uh, hope this is a lasting uh, situation. One thing that has happened, I think, with uh, with this past Republican administration. And I give, uh, I give President Bush credit for this and, and Colin Powell and lots of other people. Uh, the, uh, the tendency for, uh, 
detractors to, to just hammer on foreign aid mercilessly and to, and to make this so difficult for a lot of members to support foreign aid and to put forward all kinds of uh, damaging amendments to cut foreign aid, to kind of demonize foreign aid. All, you all know what I'm talking about, and you can remember times in our history where this was um, pretty recent history where, where this was a quite common exercise on Capitol Hill. That really hasn't happened. It hasn't happened uh, during the, uh, the Bush presidency, and so as a, as a result, um, a, a lot of people who might otherwise have uh, been tempted to, to, to uh, try to go after foreign aid uh, have, have actually been part of a, of, a, of a coalition that has maintained uh, fairly decent aid levels. I don't look for great increases, and I do look for some shifts within aid categories, but I do not at this point detect a... Uh, any, any kind of move to uh, to greatly uh, decrease the overall level of aid. Uh, David may have heard differently, but well, I don't. I don't think so. And I certainly I hope that's not just wishful thinking. I really. No, I don't, uh, I don't think know. it is. And let me say <coughs> that um, having worked with with Lorne and and Ken over the years, I've been on the board of the IRI for more than two decades. And um, one of the responsibilities that that I had early on was to ensure that. Some of our colleagues who wanted to gut funding for the National Endowment for Democracy were not successful. And I'm happy to say that we've gone through those uh, debates. And frankly, uh, those of us who are very committed to democracy building have succeeded. And we have prevailed, I'm happy to say. And uh, I, don't, I don't see an effort being made to undermine it. Why? Because, again, uh, one of the... Uh, suppose you can say a silver lining emerging from the tremendous expenditures we've had in Iraq and Afghanistan over the past several years, then the, the notion, as Ronald Reagan pointed out in his, in his speech, the notion of building up these institutions uh, is certainly much more cost effective than relying on the military as a means to bring about uh, self-determination uh, in these countries. And uh, obviously, I believe that both are very, very important, and our national security is priority number one. But I see democracy building as, a, as an important part of our national security. And we will continue, uh, I think, to have an interesting debate on this question. Um, but uh, and I should add here that the United States Agency for International Development has been extraordinarily helpful to, to our work and uh, in, in this quest for democracy building. But I think, Ken, before we came out, Ken was very correctly talking about the need to uh, look at uh, the priorities. And David mentioned in his remarks this notion of having too much go into one particular area. And so just as is the case, and Alex and I were saying this uh, earlier before we came out too, the notion of ensuring the most cost-effective use of democracy building dollars is, uh, is a challenge. And we always need to be vigilant in ensuring that we do that. Although in many ways, on the democracy building front, it gets back to uh, uh, Field's great directive on advertising, uh, you know, when he, Marshall Field, when he said, I know that only half of my, my advertising budget is effective, but you tell me which half is effective. And so uh, we, we don't always know exactly how we can uh, determine the level of success, but we should establish whatever gauges we possibly can. The first hand I saw was over here. If I can ask you to step up to the microphone, identify your name and the institutional affiliation. Hi, I'm Vladimir Karamorza with RTVI, Russian Television. I got a question specifically on, on Russia, where everybody agrees uh, democratic institutions have been rolled back completely in the last nine years. Uh, Vice President Biden, in his speech in Munich uh, last week, first major foreign policy speech, he talked a lot about. Um, having uh, cooperation with Russia, improving relations with Russia. He didn't mention a word about democracy or human rights problems. Do you expect this new administration and the new Congress to do something about um, democracy in Russia, maybe engaging in dialogue with the Russian democratic opposition or the remaining, what remains of the independent media and things like that? And what do you think should be done about it? Thank you. Do you want to bring Ken, Ken on that? Ken or well, that? well, I want to say that he did mention democracy, as a matter of fact, in a very forceful way. He talked. The Vice President talked about uh, that diplomacy in this section about the need for greater diplomacy, um, something that this administration, the Obama administration, will pursue more aggressively. He said diplomacy isn't enough, that you also need democracy and development. 
Um, so he had a whole section in that speech about democracy. So uh, from reading that speech, I think that you can assume that that will part, be part of the dialogue with, with Russia. And, um, and uh, between uh, President Obama and uh, President Medvedev when they meet in April, and I assume that uh, there will be a continuing commitment on this front. Um, but I can't speak for the administration, but certainly in, in the Vice President's speech, he was forceful on the issue. Needless to say, I can't speak for the administration. <laughs> but uh, having, I was actually there for the speech, and he did refer to a number of areas where we do disagree with Russia. He was very, very forceful on the line <coughs> talking about the regions of Georgia that have been taken over, for example. It is true that in that section he didn't talk about democracy. He talked about it at some length later in the speech. So I think it's, we would be mistaken if we think that there's going to be a wholesale engagement with Russia. I think it would also be fair to say if that happens, my guess is it wouldn't last very long um, because I'm, I'm not seeing the kind of responses that one would hope for coming out of Russia. I think that's the kind of, it is certainly the case that in the first term of the Bush administration, there was a lot more engagement. But I think by the second term, people had figured out they weren't getting what they were, had hoped to get back, and the second term looked a lot different. So I'd be very surprised to see a wholesale engagement and just forgetting about all these other issues. I'd add one uh, point to a sort of a, uh, an ancillary benefit <coughs> to the work of our commission. As I said, Georgia is uh, one of our 12 partner countries. And uh, last uh, in December, uh, we had a delegation in Georgia. And uh, John Kerry was in Georgia just a few days before we were there and had met, as we did, with President Saakashvili. And, um, the one request that was made by President Saakashvili and other leaders in his government was that we uh, pursue the establishment of a U.S.-Georgia free trade agreement. And I've been working with Senator Kerry on this in our quest to put together uh, bipartisan support for this. President Saakashvili, with whom I spoke, uh, I guess, week before last, maybe it was last week or the week before, um, feels very, very strongly about the need, need for that. And as we look at the challenge that Georgia faces, um, you know, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, I believe that the idea of strengthening our economic ties, which has been as really an offshoot of our democracy building effort there, will go a long way towards dealing with that challenge. What about the market inside Russia? That's my question. Uh, externally. Oh. Yeah, well, they haven't asked us for an HDAC uh, program uh, in <laughs> Russia quite yet, have they, uh, David? Well, the. Uh, The implication of what I had said earlier about uh, about working with countries that are in in the right place in terms of uh, democratic development and transition, uh, I, th I think we uh, we're, we're taking on some some pretty great challenges. But we also, I think, now just talking about HDAC and about the kind of work we do, <coughs> we do understand, uh, I think, what our strengths are and what some of our limitations might be. And we, uh, we are operating only in places where there's a full and willing and eager partnership and where there's a certain development already underway in the parliament that we can facilitate and, in, and encourage. Now, that uh, uh, in, in the, uh, the remaining work in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, and we're, we're at work in Macedonia, Georgia, and, and, and Ukraine, some places I would say more successfully than others. But uh, we, we understand that for our kind of work, there really, there really are some pretty, uh, pretty important preconditions that uh, are, are going to determine where we can be most uh, effective and where the leverage, whatever we've got to offer, can be most, uh, most util best utilized. Let me say one more thing on Russia. As difficult as our economic situation is here, there are a number of countries around the world that are going through or are going to go through a much more difficult situation. And I think what this administration is going to encounter is a very, very dynamic situation in places like China, Iran, Venezuela, Russia. It is also the case that this economic, these economic problems are going to affect friends, countries in Latin America, places like Ukraine, et cetera. But I, my guess is that the, the uh, if we assume that things are just going to continue on as they are in places like China and Venezuela and Russia, we're very much mistaken. 
that there's going to be a very dynamic situation and opportunities will arise there. Last one. Before the, the, the congressmen leave, and I don't know what time they have to depart, but I wanted to make one point about HDAC. It gets beyond the Russia issue. Um, traditionally, I think, over the past quarter century, uh, when you look at the international development community at large, uh, they have tended to look at uh, development in terms of supporting state institutions government ministries to deliver, and to the development of civil society. And in the process, they have largely ignored the institutions of representative democracy, the political parties and parliaments within which they operate. And at the same time, there have been a number of studies, the most recent by Stephen Fish at, at Berkeley, who have made a correlation between the strength of, of legislatures and the stability of a country that if the legislatures fail to fulfill their special role, it will place in jeopardy the democratic system itself. Um, and oftentimes, the peer-to-peer -peer support um, that, uh, that parliaments and parliamentarians provide each other becomes quite significant in this effort. And, and the HTAC initiative has become so important because it, oftentimes, Members of Congress will travel to uh, uh, foreign countries, and they will meet with heads of state and heads of government and government ministries, and they have traditionally not spent enough time with their peers. And the, the commission has provided now a, a vehicle through which members of Congress can support their colleagues in other countries in support of an institution that has largely been, if not ignored, marginalized in the development community. And so I think it is quite significant. And I think it is being welcomed by parliaments, and I speak as an organization that is sort of operational on the ground, along with IRI. We see among parliaments that we work with a, a real deep appreciation for the commitment of the commission and the time that is spent by individual members of Congress to support their, their peers in these countries. Thanks for that, Ken. And the one thing um, that I would add is that uh, one of the reasons that members of Congress have had a tendency to do that is that um, there are parliaments around the world that, uh, for all intents and purposes, are impotent. And we know that to be the case. And we have felt that if you have the rule of law, and it's great to see the former Attorney General here, who is clearly focused on that internationally, and as you look at uh, security relations, trade relations, things like that, we know that for that to continue to be successful, it is imperative that you build a parliament to, uh, to help ensure that. And so, uh, again, it, because of this commission's commitment to building the strength of that parliament, oversight of the executive branch, and you know, better constituent services, and having libraries, and a budget process and all, uh, I mean, I think that that is, uh, I think that's part of our goal here, is to strengthen those institutions within the countries. And I think one of the best lessons you give is walking in the room together. People are always stunned that NDI and IRI work closely together. But overseas, sometimes the best lesson we can give is to walk in the room as the two competing American political parties mm -hmm. and say, in our system, nobody goes to jail, nobody goes into exile because of who wins. We have to work together. You know, one of the things that I've observed, uh, actually, is that one of the, the, the greatest challenges, and, and today the elections are taking place in Israel, and we know that Sipi Libni had a, a difficult time in trying to build a, a coalition uh, going back three months. And uh, as we look at these 12 partner countries, uh, for us, uh, while it's not enshrined in our Constitution at all, one of our greatest strengths is the two-party system. And you guys know it better than we, the multi-party uh, structures that exist in so many uh, countries create a very unique mm -hmm. and often difficult challenge. Right. Exactly. Am I not right on that count? Yeah. Although there are some people who argue that parliamentary systems provide more stability in new democracies because they are more ex uh, inclusive um, for that initial phase. Now, when you have a fractionalized party system, when you have 60 or 70 or 80 mm -hmm. political right. parties, it creates huge problems. Open it up in the middle there. And I just got the high sign from the back that you guys are on the hook with us until 4 o'clock. You don't have to be pulled out for a little. So. <laughs> Paul Vaca, Georgetown University. If we were here talking about AIDS or malaria, we'd probably be talking about working with other countries to jointly fund and implement programs. 
But yet when we talk about democracy assistance, we rarely talk about bringing in other democracies that have also been at this game for quite a while. I'm wondering, looking at the new administration, the new Congress, uh, to what extent do we see working with other democracies to jointly fund and implement uh, democracy assistance? You know, I've been uh, president of IRI twice, once in the 90s and once in this decade. The biggest difference in doing this work in this decade is how many more countries are engaged in this work now and how closely we work with them. In the 1990s, it was us, the British and the Germans, doing this work. Now there are dozens of countries from Australia to South Korea to South Africa to Central Europe to Latin America that are doing this work. We work with Mexico in other Latin American countries. If you had told me that 10 years ago, I would have just laughed and I would have said that's not possible. Um, more and more of our staffs are from other countries, preferably, frankly, recent democracies. You know, people look at Americans when they're you know, when you're trying to help them, assist them building their democracy, and they say, well, you really don't understand. You know, you're wealthy, you've been a democracy for 200 and some years. But when somebody from Serbia or somebody from El Salvador or somebody from South Korea that Ken and I have brought, Ken or I have brought to the country walks in, there is a real empathy um, that they, you know, that really advances and catalyzes the program. So just in the last, I would say, five or six years, it is a dramatic difference. And really, um, by working with them, enormous amounts of synergy. It's, it's not one plus one. It's one times many, many things to be able to help. So I, I would say it's something that has uh, well along uh, at this point and hopefully will only increase because it's all for the better. Lord reminded me of an anecdote which I've shared with him that was part of the work of the IRI. Mm -hmm. in the, uh, in the well, nearly 20 years ago, uh, my chief of staff was in Romania working on democracy. Do you remember this story, Lauren? You know, working on, on uh, democracy building there. They had gone through elections, and he spent time working with training people as the elections were taking place and finished that work. And uh, four years ago, he was in Iraq, and this woman came up to him as they were working on the election there and said, you trained me in Romania for our election and reintroduced herself. And to me, that was one of the best anecdotes that I've ever gotten on the fact that your quest and our shared quest of taking these developing and developed democracies and bringing them into the process is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not only countries, by the way, too. It's, uh, if you look at intergovernmental organizations right now, the United Nations Development Program uh, which is the aid arm of the United Nations, approximately 40% of its budget now goes to democracy and governance programs. Uh, the OAS has a democratic charter. The African Union is in the process of doing this. The OSCE has been engaged in this for many years. So this is really a community of organizations and intergovernmental organizations and donor aid agencies now that see sort of this interconnectedness between economic development and, and political development it's changed, as Lauren said, it's changed dramatically over the last 20 years. And that's the, the, the irony as democracy promotion, although I hate that term because we do more reacting than promoting, we're reacting to events that are taking place on the ground, as it's become a little more controversial here because of the Iraq war and because of the elections in Palestine and in Egypt, the, the irony is that it has become much more accepted internationally, even among the most conservative um, uh, uh, international financial institutions um, that basically stay away from politics. So this has truly been now an international consensus on this issue. And I think that uh, it will continue to be a bipartisan issue here, uh, despite the controversies that have surrounded the Iraq war and, and those elections. I, th I think there are uh there's a lot of potential here for work with other countries, but I uh, I don't know of any other country where the parliament is engaged uh, directly in the kind of exercise that we're that is engaged in. And moreover, um, we we try very hard. Uh, uh, Ken stressed, uh, I think, rightly the uh, importance of the member engagement. That's really what we what we bring to this this kind of peer relationship. But we also uh, want very much to be more than just 
member-to-member uh, -member exchanges and visits and, 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 and relationships. We, uh, we have an extensive program with staff, and, and this involves workshops uh, here with staff, uh, budget staff, uh, central leadership staff, committee staff who, who come here. We send teams out to individual countries or groups of countries. This, this whole thing is more than member exchanges. It, it, it really has to do with strengthening capacity, and, and we all know that means uh, working with staff. And, we have and the CRS the Library of Congress. CRS works very closely with us, as well as staff from the, from the Hill. And um, so it's a, it's a unique program, I think. I don't know of any mm -hmm. country that comes, uh, comes close. Uh, at the same time, there are, there, there, there are uh, efforts afoot that, that I think we can, uh, where, where we can join forces and really ought to be open to that uh, in, in the future. I, I'll tell a quick anecdote my, myself uh, because uh, this kind of international effort is uh, is connected in my mind to the least successful effort I ever was involved in. Um, in uh, in the nineties, there was uh, uh, with the Frost Sullivan Commission. There there was uh, also uh, in the NATO assembly, the, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. There was some uh, outreach going on of, of a similar sort with. Uh, countries in Central and Eastern Europe, and, and actually in some cases the, uh, the people who had been through the program in places like Poland and the Baltics then, then uh, worked in some of the other countries. It, it, it really was pretty interesting what uh, went on, and I was part of one such team in, uh, in Slovakia. The, the only trouble was that in between the planning of the, it was it's an orientation for new members, in between the planning of this uh, orientation and the execution of it, uh, the wrong side had won the uh, election. Mm -hmm. The, the former communists had won big time, and so um, I've never had a less receptive audience in all my life. Uh, <laughs> these beefy guys uh, just daring us to interest them uh, from, the out, from, the, from the provinces, uh, the former communist officials who, who weren't, let's say, a very uh, receptive audience. So it doesn't always work. But, um, but actually, there is some precedent for, for that kind of, um, kind of work, with um, certainly with other European uh, countries. and I. I we're, we're very much open to de developing that, but but I can't say that there's in any of our twelve countries that this is very far advanced right now. We we it's it's more a, a future aspiration. Yes. And uh, Nestor Riqueda, an associate press reporter for Latin America. I have a question on Latin America. <coughs> and uh, what kind of work uh, you think uh, the admin the Obama's administration needs to do in Latin America? especially in countries like Venezuela, uh, where in the next uh, Sunday referendum, the President Chavez is looking to be a president for life. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you'll have to ask that of, of the administration and the incoming policymakers who will be dealing with Latin America. But I, but I think uh, even President Chavez once confided to uh, some people that he is not the cause, he's the result. Um, in a sense, he's the result of failed political institutions in Latin America uh, that were seen as corrupt and out of touch um, with the citizenry. And not surprising, we have found in Latin America and in any place around the world, people are in a demanding mood. Um, and um, uh, I think Stiglitz once said, if, if people do not get what they expect from their political institutions, they're either going to go to the streets uh, to solve, and that is not the place to solve public policy issues, or they end up oftentimes voting uh, over time, voting for populist leaders who offer very easy answers to complex questions, and then move against those, those very institutions that have been part of uh, the political life of a country. So in my view, there has to be a much greater investment in reforming and modernizing and renewing political institutions in the hemisphere. Um, so they begin to, as Congressman Price said, they, they begin to deliver um, on quality of life issues and not just for the privileged few. And they have to connect with citizens. They have to begin opening up their political institutions to women and youth and indigenous communities um, because if they don't, we're going to find more situations like we have in, in a number of countries in Latin America. So I think that's the greatest challenge in the hemisphere. 
Um, it, it, it is, is how these institutions perform on economic issues, how they perform on quality of life issues, and how they deal with the citizenry. Not to be too provocative, but uh, I will anyway. So um, I, I happen to, to feel uh, very strongly that one of the most important things that we as a country can do, and I've spoken with President Obama about this, is to ensure that we proceed with more trade agreements with countries within this hemisphere. Uh, and I think that one of the uh, greatest uh, mistakes that was made in the last Congress was the unprecedented decision to, for the first time since the 1974 Trade Act was put into place, uh, denying a vote that was promised uh, President Uribe in Colombia uh, as they proceeded with good faith negotiations for an FTA, uh, a chance for that vote to take place in the Congress of the United States. As we look at the uh, challenges of, of dealing with, uh, with Correa, Morales, and with Chavez, and the, the strength that President Uribe has shown, and the impact that, that has had on other countries on the South American continent, and frankly around the world, uh, I hope very much that we will be able to proceed with that, because I think that'll go a long way towards doing exactly what, what Ken has said, improving the quality of life, the standard of living, and demonstrating that the United States of America can, in fact, uh, maintain its commitments. I think it's going to be very important for uh, President Obama in the, in the first place simply to express a commitment to, uh, to, to give a great priority, front burner priority to uh, this hemisphere and to our relationships in this hemisphere. It's, uh, it was, of course, a, a, a very important uh, way that uh, John F. Kennedy launched his presidency with the announcement of the Alliance for Progress and then action that, that, that followed to make, uh, make good on that commitment. I think, uh, I think uh, peoples of this, uh, of this hemisphere are, are, are looking for that, and, and, um, and I hope the President can, can deliver it and can then work bilaterally in, in all sorts of ways to, uh, to, to improve uh, relationships and help uh, bring about the payoff that, uh, that Ken uh, describes. I hope we can contribute in a more substantial way to, to, to this from the Congress, and, and as far as HDAC is concerned, uh, I think this has been an underdeveloped uh, area of our own involvement, not for any lack of interest. It's just uh, kind of worked out that way. Uh, we, uh, we have plans, though, to, um, to, uh, to rectify that. And, and I think you will see us in the next uh, couple of years much more uh, directly involved with partner parliaments in, uh, in Latin America. Again, a number of those parliaments, for better or for worse, are, uh, are, are mature parliaments, pretty well set in their uh, ways. Others are, are not... Uh, uh, you know, taking off in the way that, um, that that would make it possible for us to engage. But there are a number of countries in Central and South America where I think uh, what we have to offer can really uh, make a difference, and, and, and we're going to uh, explore that with great, uh, with great energy. And an interesting point that David makes and Ken touched on as well is, uh, you know, his concern about the issue of promotion. We really see these countries as partners uh, as opposed to our... Uh, telling them exactly the way it's done, because we regularly describe the United States of America as um, and our democracy as a work in progress, and we learn that every single day. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, I mean, I'm I'm uh, reminded I in there was the IRI delegation that we had on July 2nd of 2000, when uh, when former Secretary of State Jim Baker and I got to co-lead that, that delegation. Mexico. You were there to Mexico. And we saw, after 71 years, the first transition from the, I, uh, the, uh, the, the PRI to the PAN's uh, success there. And um, I, I remember uh, on the night of July 2nd, 2000, uh, Jim Baker and I were standing in the hills above Puebla, Mexico, checking the validity of ballots. And four months later, he was doing the exact same thing in South Florida. And so that demonstrated clearly that democracy is a work in progress. I remember I called him when he was down there, and I just reminded him that we were in Mexico doing the same thing he was doing in Florida. And so that's why we do see our work with these uh, countries as a partnership as opposed to our in any way telling them how it's done. Mm -hmm. the, but also the Western Hemisphere may be a victim of its own success as well. I think Freedom House rates 
Latin America is the most successful in terms of democracy, the most successful region in the world. And if you look at funds that are dedicated for this, uh, for, for this hemisphere, they are alarmingly uh, low. And so, and, and I think we, we take, take certain things for, for granted in this hemisphere, and we shouldn't because we, it's a great peril that we, that we ignore this hemisphere on some of these fundamental political development issues. Don't forget, Venezuela used to be the, the country that used to be the exporter of democracy. Yeah. And its party foundations used to, used to spend a great deal of time throughout the hemisphere and outside the hemisphere uh, supporting political party development and democratic development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fair and so we, we, mm -hmm. we, take, we take these things for granted. With that, I'm afraid uh, we promised folks that we would be done by 4 o'clock. Uh, we have two, temp two things to tempt your interest in this continuing discussion. One is uh, we were honored to have Representative Price have an article in the latest issue of the Washington Quarterly uh, for seven lessons for the new administration. There are copies of that that should be outside on your way out if you get a chance to stop and pick them up. The second is on March 11th, we'll have an event to release the findings of the Democracy in the Future of U.S. Security Strategy Report. Uh, the punchline for that, I'll give you a little preview, is exactly what Ken was talking about in moving away from promotion and towards support as the principal diplomatic umbrella for U.S. efforts in this area. Based on a series of interviews we had throughout the uh, security community, which included with Brent Scowcroft, Jim Steinberg, Lee Hamilton, and a number of others outside of the democracy area and in uh, security policy as a whole. That will be on March 11th, about a month uh, from now. In the meantime, uh, please help me um, both thank uh, Ken Wallach and Lauren Craner for co-hosting this with us, and especially for Representatives Pryor and Representative Dreis for their very valuable time with us here today for an hour. Thank you very much. Thank you.